it's a great honor for me to be invited to this talk series. So yeah, actually I took several courses in this auditorium and it feels pretty different by standing on the other side of the auditorium. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to talk about adaptable robotic manipulation using tactile sensors. I wanna start with this question, why are robots not around us? We all know that we have robots in our lab and in the factories, but we don't see many robots in our daily lives. It is not just because we don't need them. We definitely need some robots in the labor intensive sectors such as kitchen, healthcare, and e-commerce pipelines, including packaging and delivery. So why don't we see robots in this area? The one reason is that they are all contact rich environments. Unfortunately, robots do not handle the contact events well. So for example, in this simple pick and place operation, robots do not handle the objects that are slipping away. And also robots having hard time dealing with contacts on multiple locations, for example, on the box that is holding and also the contacts on its body. So as you saw in the video, contact adaptive control is challenging because contact properties such as friction coefficients and the inertia of the object is, uh, are often unknown. And contact conditions are changing continuously and discontinuously. And also contacts can be made on multiple locations. Because of this uh, uncertain and unpredictable nature of the contact, then we need some tactile sensors to achieve those contact adaptive control. For this reason, many researchers have developed tactile sensors from 80s, and now we have some commercially available tactile sensors in the market, and still it is an active research area. Despite these developments, we don't see many robots equipped with these tactile sensors that much. So the one reason is that tactile sensor is difficult to be generalizable because robots have different hardwares and different tasks and different contact physics. Therefore, each robot application requires a unique type of form factor and functionality of the tactile sensor. That's why I believe the research of the tactile sensor development should be combined with the research of the robotic application. So that sets my research vision of adaptable robotic control using tactile sensing. So. In my new position at UC Santa Cruz, I'm planning to work on the neural tactile sensing scheme that enables the adaptable dexterous manipulation and reactive whole body manipulation. From this robotic system, I believe we can achieve the responsive collaborating robot that can work with us and work each other by making contacts together even on our bodies. So toward this vision, I've researched uh, tactile sensors in, during my PhD and the postdoc. So I developed tactile sensors for legged robots and developed tactile sensors for the gecko adhesive grippers and slip sensors for the industrial gripper and some stretchable sensing array and tactile sensing for the suction cup gripper. Today, I'm gonna focus on presenting these two uh, research projects. So first, I'm gonna talk about the in-hand manipulation using multimodal sleep sensing. Oh, and then I'll explain the haptic exploration and grip monitoring of the suction cup gripper. And lastly, I'll wrap this talk by giving you some remarks on my future works. 
So first, in-hand manipulation using multimodal sleep sensing. So, uh, so now we have commercially available anthropomorphic robotic hands that shows phenomenal dexterity. However, do we always need these high degree of freedom robotic hands to achieve such dexterity? Researchers have shown extrinsic dexterity that utilize the contact forces and gravity as an additional degree of freedom. In this control, they use a lot of linear sleep and rotational sleep to do such a dexterous manipulation. When they plan this control, they use a lot of uh, analysis on the limit surface and the friction cone which assumes a known friction coefficients and the inertial information, which are not always the case in the practical application. So this sets my research goal of this project to adaptively manipulate unknown objects with extrinsic dexterity using sliding contacts. To achieve this extrinsic dexterity, I think we should have some tactile sensors that resembles our human mechanoreceptors. So we have four types of uh, tactile mechanoreceptors for static pressure and also the dynamic response that is induced by the contact events and the slip, slip of the object. From this inspir inspiration, many researchers have developed multimodal tactile sensors, but most of the time they used multiple transducers for each type of model, each type of modality that makes the system so much complex to process the signal, and that's why they are so much difficult to be scalable. And also, as we saw in the previous video, we want to use the linear and rotational slip. And the tactile sensor is desirable to differentiate those two slip modes. However, in the previous works, they only trained on small set of objects, which may not be generalizable. And also, the gel side sensor can do such differentiation, but they may need some surface features to track. So this sets my sensor design goal. So the first one is to design a compact multimodal sensor using single transducer. And the second goal is to monitor the linear and rotational slip in more generalizable manner. So this is my solution, the NIP array sensor. So I'll explain the working principle and the application of it the in-hand pivoting manipulation in the following slides. First, the working principle. So my sensor is a capacitive type, which consists of the silicon rubber nib and the grounded conductive fabric and the bottom PCB layer. Under each nib, we have four directional electrodes and we measure the capacitance between these electrodes and the grounded conductive fabric. So when the nib is under normal pressure, then all four capacitance will increase simultaneously. And when, it's, when it is under shear force, then we'll see a differential and directional capacitance change. And when the nib vibrates, then we can see those vibration by looking at the frequency response of the capacitance. The last one is particularly useful to estimate the slip direction because the slip will induce the stick, will induce the stick and slip motion that vibrates the nip. So by looking at the direction of the capacitance vibration, we can estimate where the object is sliding. And there's one more secret about this sensor, which is about the internal routing. So we have 36 nibs, and that means we have 144 electrodes under the layer. 
to reduce the number of wiring, we group them into three by three area. And in each group, we connected the electrodes on the same side all together. So that means we only need to connect the 36 wires or 36 channels to the microcontroller to measure the capacitance. So to, to measure each individual capacitance level, we can connect one channel at a time to the capacitance sensing module. However, nothing stops us from connecting multiple channels at the same time. And in this architecture, switching sequence means, uh, means the capacitance conversion, and the conversion takes finite number of time. So if we can reduce the number of conversion by clustering multiple electrodes, then we can increase the effective sampling rates. If we can have a sufficiently fast sampling rates, then we can capture the dynamic stimulus induced by the sliding motion. So here, here are the two examples of how we can cluster the electrodes, the one for the linear sleep and the other is for rotational sleep. So we chose these clustering patterns by looking at the shear stress fields difference. Okay, so let's compare the two modes, the individual scanning mode and the fast clustered modes. So there's a trade-offs in the spatial resolution and temporal resolution. And by combining these two modes together, we can achieve the multimodal sensing by using single, the same transducers. So this is how we combine these two modes in a subsampling sequence. So for each sampling, we, we get eight numbers. Two comes from the linear sliding, and two comes from the rotational sliding, and four comes from the subset of the slow individual scanning mode. So by doing this sequence, we can achieve 300 hertz of fast clustered mode sampling, which is sufficient enough to capture the vibration of the nip. Okay, so using this sensor, we tested how we can differentiate the linear sliding and rotational sliding motion. When we take a look at the slow individual nodes, we can see the shear force field patterns are quite distinguishable. But more importantly, we can take a look at the frequency response of each fast clustered nodes. And as we expected, only the targeted sleep mode and um, so sleep motions activates and are activated by each sleep modes. Okay, so now we can differentiate the linear and rotational sleep. So we move on to the application of in-hand manipulation. So in this, con uh, in this demo, the control goal is to lift an object from the table to its upright position. So the first step is to make a gentle contact. So here we assume that the object could be delicate, so we didn't want to apply a large grass force. So we used the, uh, the fast clustered mode to capture the contact events faster so we can stop closing the gripper. And then we lift the object slowly and increase the grass force to suppress the linear slip. So whenever we detect the linear slips, then we increment the grip force. And then we lift the object somewhat faster while we rotate the object up to its upright pose. So in this case, we monitor the rotational sliding mode, uh, mode and if there is no rotational slip is detected, then we decrease the grass force. 
but that rarely happened in our test. And we can also check the uh, upright position of the object by looking at the higher frequency bands. Because from the kinetic constraints, the object will rotate faster when it reaches to the upright pose. So this faster rotational speed can be captured by the high frequency band of the response. All right, then the last step is gently release the object onto the table. So here, this controller is solely based on the event detection of the slip. So it, it, can, so it works regardless of the inertia and the friction of the surface. So we tested on different weights and different center of mass and different textures, but in overall, we could make about 80% time make it succeed. But I want to note that most of the failure comes from the releasing phase, not the pivoting phase. So if we apply some more sophisticated releasing mechanism, then I believe the success rate will boost up close to the 100%. OK, so this was my first half of the talk. So do you have any question before I move on? Yeah. Oh, just a short question. Oh, when you say it's regardless of surface uh, and to weight, uh, how about like, the geometry? Like, because like for, for a model sensing, like, if that's the uh, context not conformal, does that change your like, uh, sensing patterns? Yeah, that's a great question. And definitely in my sensor, because it has a nibs. So if, it, if we have a surface textures that can vary um, as it rotates or slides, then that will actually even vibrate the nibs more. So I think in that case, it's more desirable than the flat surface cases. So it will work better for us, uh, for my case, I guess. Okay, then I'll move on for my second half of the talk. So in this research, I'm gonna explain about the haptic exploration and grip monitoring of the suction cup gripper. So when we use the suction gripper, one of the challenge is how to plan the right uh, contact points to engage. So in the previous work of DexNet, then they used the depth camera to, uh, and then they fit it into the model to predict where is the best contact points of the suction cup. But they used the vision and they assumed the surface is smooth. But in reality, when we take a, take a photo with using the depth camera, then the reflective surface could be distorted a lot and it may lose uh, fine surface details because of the low resolution. And another application of the suction cup is the forceful peak and place motion. But in that control, they assumed a known uh, inertia and, freak, uh, and friction coefficients, which again may not be the case in the practical applications. So we may need some sensors for the suction gripper as well. So these are the, uh, some solutions for the suction gripper. So obviously we can use some vacuum pressure from the pump side, but it, it only gives us binary like success and failure information. And also we lose the useful information from the local contact from the suction cup. <clears throat> well, there is some indirect method of measuring the deformation, but still it is not direct measure of the suction seal. And I found one research that puts the four sensors at the contact plate, plane, but that means it will interfere the suction seal formation. So 
to tackle this problem, I propose this uh, smart suction cup that can, that can directly measure the local contacts without any interference in the suction seal formation. So here we redesigned the single bellows suction cup to make it have the internal four chambers and we connect pressure sensors to each chamber. So the pressure sensor measures the leakage flow through each chamber and because they are placed remote, remotely from the suction seal, then it doesn't interfere any suction seal formation. Okay, so we validate this design by using some simulation uh, from CFD, the computational fluid dynamics. And we set two exemplary case. So one we call the linear leakage flow and the other we call the horizontal leakage flow. So the, the vertical leakage will mostly happen when we misalign the suction cup to the object. And the horizontal flow will happen when we peel off from the surface. In the vertical leakage case, most of the leakage flow comes through the chamber close to the leakage point. While the horizontal case, the most of the flow will go through the chamber across the leakage point. This results in different vacuum pressure distribution. So in the vertical case, the lowest vacuum pressure will show in the chamber close to the leakage point, while the horizontal case, the lowest pressure will happen across the chamber from the leakage points. Okay, so this is how my sense, my smart suction cup works, and we applied, we applied it to do some haptic exploration and grip monitoring. So here, haptic exploration means that we want to find the best contact location by just sliding over the surface without detecting detaching the suction cup. So one obvious way that we can go is to look at the pressure sensor level. And definitely this pressure, the vacuum pressure will be somewhat proportional to the smoothness of the surface. However, it results in pretty high vacuum pressure, which will engage on a surface which, is, which are not that ideal. So instead, what we can do is we can control the solenoid valve by PWM and we can lower the duty cycle. So the resulting vacuum pressure becomes quite low. But still, this vacuum pressure trends remains the same with respect to the smoothness of the surface. And we, when we take a look at the raw pressure data, then it oscillates from the PWME. So we can do some Fourier transform to see the magnitude of the frequency response. And these trends remains the same. Okay, so using this lowered vacuum pressure, we can even slide on the surfaces. So in this example, we start from the left-hand side and because it was misaligned, we see the pressure distribution that was expected from the vertical leakage flow case. But as we move along the surface, then the pressure distribution change and it corresponds to the, to the horizontal leakage simulation. And as we move along the surface, we can keep track of the, the overall pressure response. And then we can finally find the smoothest surface by looking at the frequency response of the overall channel. Okay, that was the lateral searching. But we can also do some 
surface alignments to find the surface normal of the object. So in this case, we tested on two exemplary uh, edges with sharper and more wider corner. So in this case, we can also take a look at the pressure distribution from left and right hand side. And we can find the surface normal where it should be aligned with the zero angle. We can also evaluate the surface normal by looking at the pressure level at that angle, <coughs> at that angle. So because it has an increase in the pressure level, only the wider case could make the suction seal formation, while the other case failed to make a good suction seal. OK, so I presented two modes of the exploration, one with lateral search, and the other is a orientational search. So we can control this transfer, the end effector transformation matrix guided by the difference of the pressure sensor reading. So we can simply make two difference vector, the difference between left and right hand side, and also the difference from top and bottom side. In the lateral search, we can maintain the orientation stay still, while we can move the center point of the suction cup along the vector sum of the two. And for the surface alignments, we can keep the translation part zero, and we can rotate the orientation by turning the suction cup along the vector that is perpendicular to the vector sum of the two difference. And also, we can tune the intensity of each haptic expiration by setting the weight value w to our increments. So, so basically, we have some control over the weight value to choose what motion we want to do. So when we choose the weight value 0, then it only search laterally by maintaining the orientation stay still. And when we have weight value, weight value 0.5, then we have both lateral and orientational search. And for weight value 1, then we only change the orientation. OK, so we tested this haptic exploration control to see if it can improve the existing GQCNN. So this is my favorite the th 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 3D printed objects, which is pretty challenging because it has a fine details which cannot be easily captured from the depth image. So we used the GQCNN, which is, which is the model used in the DEXnet. Well, they call it grasp quality convolutional neural net. So we downloaded the pre-trained GQCNN and fit in our new depth image. And it predicts where the contact points should be and what's the uh, confidence of that point. And from that point, we applied some haptic exploration to see if we can make the controller succeed. And I also want to note that we are using the pre-trained model that was trained from the different robotic arm and different types of depth image and also different suction cup. OK, so here we tested on 10 potential points that was predicted from the GQCNN. But using the initial contact, we could only make it succeed by 20% success rate. But when we apply our adaptive grasping with the fixed weight of 0.5, then we can ramp up the success rate by 70%. And also, we tested on this pretty challenging objects. And we tried 32 points that were predicted from the GQCNN, and only 56% were succeed at the first time. But 
by adding our adaptive motion, we could make it like 91% of the case to be succeed, to be successful. So here we tested on the weight values of five different values. And if any of them succeed, we marked as a success. So the remaining question for us is how we can predict the weight values from the given tactile information. And we are still, we are currently working hard to get a pretty good classifier. So in my preliminary uh, test, there was only like 70% accuracy. So we are working on improving those accuracy rates. Okay, so that was about the haptic exploration, and we can also do some grip monitoring while we are while we are manipulating the suction cup in a forceful manner. So in this case, we want to measure the ground tooth contact of the suction cup. So we set the FTIR, frustrated total internal reflection setups, and by taking a video from the bottom of the acrylic plates we can capture the ground truth of the suction seal formation. So as you can see in this uh, plot, then the pressure distribution at the point where it, where it, where it is about to leave the surface, is, it is pretty corresponds to the horizontal leakage case simulation. However, this suction cup is under high deformation and sometimes the frequency, I mean, the, the pressure distribution is can be pretty complex. So we rather go into the data-driven approach to estimate the contact state of the suction cup. So here we track the center of it and then we labeled each quadrant by looking at the weakest point around the suction seal ring. And we used the uh, LSTM network to predict the contact state label of each quadrant. So we designed the LSTM to predict the contact state of the 30 milliseconds future by using the data history from uh, yeah, uh, from from the start, yeah. So here we used two types of tech, uh, sensor reading, one from my uh, pressure sensor reading and the other comes from the force torque sensor on the wrist. So here we compare the brake quadrant's accuracy, meaning that whether the model can predict the points when the contact label goes below the threshold, and we set these thresholds by looking at the catastrophic failure of the suction seal. So in the results, we could improve the accuracy of the prediction about like 10 to 15% by using the vacuum pressure sensors. And also we could see the break time prediction accuracy and the result shows that we can estimate the failure 50 milliseconds before it actually happens. So that means we still have some 50 millisecond window to respond to prevent the impending uh, suction cup failure. Okay, so that sets my research goal in the near future. So I'll, st I'll keep working on the the slip sensor and the vacuum uh, and the smart suction cup to work on the bin picking scenario and also the fast pick and place operation. And we want to put some adaptable robotic control to prevent the slipping or failing objects. And I, I, I would also want to work on the neuromorphic uh, signal processing of the tactile sensors, which will enable uh, processing the large array of tactile sensors pretty efficiently. 
So therefore, we can make some tactile skins, not just for the fingertip, but also for the, for the other part of the robot body. By using such uh, tactile skins, I believe that we can achieve some whole body manipulation that utilize the contacts from not only from the hand, but also from the arm and torso. And we can also do some social touch and collaborative robots that can communicate each other by using the haptic cues. So I started with this talk by asking the question, why are robots not around us? And I believe, from my research, robots will be around us pretty soon. Yeah, I want to thank, I, 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 I want to give my uh, yeah, acknowledgments on my previous advisors and collaborator and co-authors and funding sources. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for such a, a nice talk. Um, when you were talking about the suction gripper, I, I noticed that um, it seems like the the response to uh, like a uh, horizontal flow from one side is maybe similar to vertical flow on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. uh, did you do any work to try to distinguish like what's happening exactly? Uh, like if you have a signal that's lower pressure on one side, can you distinguish if that's vertical flow on the same side or like leakage flow on the opposite side? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually that's why we wanted to go into the data-driven approach. So as you said, it could be either from the vertical flow on the other side or the horizontal flow from the uh, opposite side. So yeah, so that's, uh, I guess that's, not deterministic problem, so we want to throw some data from the tech, from the pressure value, and also from the force torque sensors to estimate the right leakage point from there. Yeah. I'll ask a very general. What, what do you think is the biggest kind of, I mean, you, you talked about this, this vision at the very beginning of having contact, being able to sense contact everywhere, uh, being important for future interaction with robots and different scenarios. What do you think is the biggest physical what, or the biggest uh, technical challenge at this stage? Right, so, so the biggest challenge is the wiring and the uh, processing of the tactile arrays. So, um, well, we can put many uh, tactile sensor units all over the place, but the remaining question is how are we gonna process them? So, so in our approach, I, I guess the current approach is more like the central processor will query the, the tactile sensing information every time, but in our body system, actually the tactile sensors tells the central processor whenever they have some stimulus. So I guess we should shift those um, processing paradigm more like our uh, human nerve system. By doing that, I guess we can have multiple arrays all over the place and easily process those information efficiently yeah. you mentioned wiring should we go to wireless uh, well that's that's one way to go but also then there's a power issue and yeah and so on and so on so yeah <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, we had another uh, researcher coming a few weeks ago talking about the uh, optic, 
optic based uh, tactile sensor. Yeah. Uh, what's your view on that, and how how is that different uh, from the NIF that you are building? Yeah, so this should be about like gel site type sensors. So I I really like it. It gives a lot of fine details of the contacts. But well, but when we think about our body. We don't have eyes all over the place, but we only have eyes on here, and all the others are the tactile sensors. So maybe, uh, well, especially when we think of expanding the sensing array all over the surface, then optical approach may be providing too much information than necessary, than it is necessary. So I believe there is a potential that we can still have um, not optical solutions for uh, getting a useful tactile information.